Form F is the CBT session record. We recommend that you fill out one of this for each patient for each session. So the form is a quick one-page form, like many of our other forms, and it has a space to fill out patient participation. Did they attend? If they didn't, were they contacted? What was their reason for absence? And if they did attend, how much did they participate? And did they complete their homework? There's a section for the module or session information. What type of therapy is it? Is it an individual therapy or a group therapy? And which session was this? And there's a box with the full CBT sessions all marked on there. There's thoughts, four sessions for that, activities, four sessions for that, and people, four sessions for that. And you can just check the one that corresponds. And then finally, there is a session um, for treatment progress. So there's the PHQ-9 score, which you can document here, what your treatment plan is for this client, and any additional comments. Now let's look at Form G. This is my personal treatment plan. This should be filled out by the client with your help. Once the treatment plan is established, you can use this form to help the client to be a little bit more on board with his or her treatment. There's a space to fill out the medications they're taking, um, a space to fill out what kind of therapy they're doing, and a space for a wellness plan. And finally, let's look at Form H. This is my personal wellness plan. These are other resources outside of therapy that the client can access on his or her own to make themselves feel better. There is a section for their resources, as well as a section for how to manage the challenges for them to recover, and how to make pleasurable activities a part of their life. This is also a one-page form. The client should fill this out, and you can have the therapist help. Now let's move on to the registry record. All the forms that we've discussed so far go into the study record. You should also set up a registry record for all of your clients. These forms include the client register and initial contact summary, which is Form I, and the register follow-up, which is Form J. You will be recording basic contact and progress information for all your clients on these two forms. So these forms are for all the clients, not just for each individual one. They all go on a summary sheet. Keeping these forms up to date is going to help facilitate consultation with CP CPIC study experts. Please update these records after any session with a client to ensure that the data is up to date and complete. So let's, now let, let's look at Form I and J. Form I is a client register and initial contact summary. And again, this is a form that you put as a summary for all of your clients. So you put the patient's name, their medical record number, the clinic where they're enrolled, who's their care manager, when the initial contact was made, the start date of treatment, and what treatment assignment is it? Is it a group or individual? Is it behavioral or meds? And are they English or Spanish speaking? Form J is a register follow-up log. And this is a very simple form that just gives space for the client's name, date, and the PHQ-9 score. And you do this for all of your clients on this one summary sheet. Now let's take a look at the PHQ-9, which is Form K, the Client Health Questionnaire. The PHQ-9 is a nine-item self-rating scale. We recommend using this short and easy administered questionnaire at the intake, as well as through the course of treatment to track the client's depression. And again, the scores, as outlined before, are as follows. Zero to four is none or minimal depression, five to nine is mild depression, 10 to 19 is moderate depression, and 20 to 27 is severe depression. So let's take a look really quickly at Form K, the PHQ-9. So the PHQ-9 has nine questions, and the client will be asked to rate it on not at all, several days, more than half the days and nearly every day for each of the statements. And after that, you just add the columns together and get the total score. Some other important forms available to you in the CPIC CBT Therapist Toolkit are the Therapist Communication Forms, Client Relapse Plan, and Safety Contract. So let's look at these forms now. Form L is a therapist communication form. This is good for communicating with inter- and intra-agency providers that are responsible for the client's care. This form says that the patient is now having the following symptoms and includes a checklist. What's the progress of the patient? The recommended treatment plan? And what are the comments or consultation requested? And then there's a space for you to leave your contact information so that the provider can contact you with their information. Form M 
is the relapse prevention plan. This is given to the client at the end of their treatment. There is a place for their contact information of important providers, their personal warning signs or triggers for when they start to relapse into depression, stressful life events that they're likely to encounter and how to minimize them, medications that they're supposed to be taking, and what are the action steps that the client should take if symptoms of depression occur. And this form should be filled out by the client with the therapist's help. Finally, let's look at the safety contract. This is used for clients who have suicidal ideation but are not needing any eminent or immediate response from an emergency psychiatric service. A lot of times you can ask these clients to sign a contract for safety. And on this contract for safety, there are things that they can do or tell themselves to make them feel better, people who care about them that they can call when they feel overwhelmed, and then there's a couple of hotline numbers and resources that they can reach as well. And there's also a number of online resources that are listed on this form. And then they sign a I will not hurt myself statement. They sign the document and you, the witness, the mental health provider also signs it with them. So we have now gone over the forms that are available to you in the CPIC CBT Therapist Toolkit. Now let's talk about some of the other items on our outline today. I wanted to point out some suggestions for assessing and addressing barriers to therapy. At the outset of therapy, it's important to assess and address barriers to treatment as it is critical to the effectiveness of the therapy for clients. It's an excellent idea to spend a few minutes talking about such barriers at the time when you first start therapy. And many clients can actually anticipate what some of these barriers might be for them, and this leaves you an opportunity to tackle such problems ahead of time. So as you might remember from Form C, the getting to know you worksheet that the client fills out, there's actually a section that talks about potential barriers. And after looking through this sheet, it could be a really good talking point to use in the first session to try to anticipate what some of these barriers are and to problem solve these issues. Adherence to any treatment regimen can also be increased by a number of suggestions, such as educating the client and empowering them, making the client a full partner in their therapy, writing down specific and explicit instructions for the client, and addressing barriers to adherence at the very outset of therapy. I also wanted to touch on cultural considerations for your clients. All clients are candidates for experiencing cultural barriers to depression treatment. If a client is a member of a minority group, though, particular sensitivity may be necessary. I have here a link from the SAMHSA's National Mental Health Information Center's document called Cultural Competence Standards in Managed Care and Mental Health Services. And this full document may be found at this link below. I've also outlined some principles of cultural competence taken from this document. Cultural competence includes attaining the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to enable administrators and practitioners within systems of care to provide effective care for diverse populations. Recovery and rehabilitation are more likely to occur when managed care system services and providers have utilized knowledge and skills that are culturally competent and compatible with the backgrounds of consumers from the four underserved and underrepresented racial ethnic groups, their families and communities. Cultural competence acknowledges and incorporates variance in normative, acceptable behaviors, beliefs, and values in determining an individual's mental wellness or illness. Incorporating those variables into assessment and treatment is also important. 